Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Friday edition Traders Week Wrap Up, what I like to call this in our trading week wrap up. Uh, cheers to all of you that uh, slogged through this week. At the end of it, really wasn't that much of a, a directional based week. We had some pain early on, then all of a sudden things rallied and looked great to the upside. So, all in all, kind of a choppy week, unless you're looking at some of these things like Bitcoin and some of the other things we're going to focus on today. So, cheers to all of you. Bib and Tucker, this is from my friend Kerry. So, Kerry, thank you much for the, the Bib and Tucker delicious bourbon. All right, so here is what we're going to talk about today. You notice my graphic was a little bit odd. I almost wanted to say it was cryptic because I have, I've, I tried to incorporate corn. I've got drugs in there, um, some AI, and, and a few other pieces that I, I definitely want to talk about. And one that I didn't get in there that it just couldn't bring it up was social media. There was a, a social media question today. Um, certainly the, the DWAC thing with President Trump and his holdings there might be of interest to some of you. Of course, I don't know if you saw how bad his day. Why do I look different today? I don't know. Why do I look different today? T-shirt? I don't know. I don't know. There we go. I have no idea. Um, so I have a bunch of different stuff to talk about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my viewer questions first, and then I'll dive into markets, because I think some of it's going to dovetail together. So I figured we'll just go that route. So let me um, first talk about the thing that I think Tom's probably getting sick of me by now, which is Bitcoin. And I only want to talk about this because I've made the point in the past that what you got was the doorway open because of these Bitcoin futures to money coming into Bitcoin. To me, that's important because, oh, I thank you. I, you mean I don't look good normally? Jeez Louise, it's the, it's the black shirt. It slims me down, you know, accentuates my features. Um, when... We look at Bitcoin, again, you guys all know my opinion of it. I'm going to try to talk less about it because I know some of you are just like enough already with it. However, I said when we get this spot Bitcoin ETF, it's going to open the doorway to retail investors buying in. And, and many of you who have been thinking about buying Bitcoin but are too confused or just don't want to deal with the stress of keeping your private keys and buying on exchanges and moving into wallets, it, it just gets a little, a little messy for some people. And they're like, I don't want to deal with that. And I totally get it. But now if you're in a IRA, I can buy IBIT, right? The spot Bitcoin ETF for BlackRock and say, hey, now all of a sudden I can have access to it. And that's going to bring in a lot more money. Not to mention that some of the Bitcoin, the other ETFs out there and mutual funds are going to start adding Bitcoin to their holdings. Now, I wanted to talk about um, the inflows because my thesis is that with all this new buying coming in and demand surging, but supply is actually going to be slowing down, then all of a sudden it feels like it's going to get uh, more parabolic in its move. So check this out. This is the inflows of Bitcoin into these ETFs. And you can see going back into January, not a lot going on, even getting to early February. And all of a sudden, as we got near, not even at the point, but as we got near the creation of these or approval of these ETFs, this should be a sign that these guys knew. Some people here don't believe in insider trading. I say BS. If you look at this chart, you can see that the amount of inflows that were pouring into these Bitcoin ETFs right around February 5th, um, you know, that really that really started this big surge. So it was actually January 11th, so it's back in here. But now you got money pouring in, and only one of them is losing. And that's net outflows from Black uh, Gr uh, Grayscale. So what you have here with Grayscale is... The GBTC, because it's a trust, because it's, fee well, it was a trust, and its fees are so high, people are selling that. So Grayscale is now forced to unload. So they're selling their Bitcoin, and, and it's actually being picked up by these other ones. But notice everything else is surging. And the dark, uh, the shaded area in the background here, the mountain chart, if you will, that's what's really important, is if you look um, at that shaded area, you realize that Bitcoin is not being created at that steep of a rate. So this demand is why we're seeing Bitcoin surge and why I do believe it's going to continue to surge. And here's the, the biggest one, which, of course, I mentioned, I think this is going to be the one that survives, is IBIT. This is BlackRock's. And just look what's happened from February 7th to February 13th. These are, I mean, this is significant amount of inflows. They had $493 million worth of Bitcoin purchased for their ETF on the 13th. There's been nothing but inflows. So it tells you that right now IBIT is just gobbling up the market share and people are buying IBIT, whether it's for long-term holding, active trading, whatever, but there's no outflows. It's been nonstop inflows of money into this and I think that that's going to um, 
continue to the upside. So I'm excited for that. I think that, that's certainly a notable point. And if we look at what's gone on with Bitcoin's price chart, and you can see those inflows reflected here. You know, it's been a, a great two weeks. I mean, January was fantastic for Bitcoin and February's off to a pretty decent start as well. You know, you do have technically two bearish candles back to back. You've got like the double shooting star going on here, which you know, it doesn't mean it's going to crash. And I do think that typically you will get a pullback in, you know, big astronomical moves like this. But long term, you're talking, you know, a year out. Yeah, I, I think you're going to see a lot more demand for this because now it's it's readily available for everybody. So enough. I'll stop with it. I apologize. I know some of you guys are getting enough with the Bitcoin. It's fine. Um, well, you know, we'll see. We'll see in five years. Right. I'm hoping that in five years, a lot of you, a lot of people are like, man, I wish you talked about it more. <laughs> Joe says, I'd still rather just buy Bitcoin. 100%, Joe, I am, I'd am. i much rather buy it. But remember, I'm not the one who's going to move the market, right? If I'm buying Bitcoin, yeah, I have a certain amount, but I'm not buying $10 million. I'm not buying $100 million worth of Bitcoin. However, when you have an Apple, a Microsoft, an Amazon, who's got 30 40 $50 billion in cash, and they decide to put 1% of their portfolio into this, what happens? Just 1%. And that's one company. You could get huge moves up here. We haven't even begun to witness the adoption. Once the adoption comes, then people are going to look at this and go, man, 100000 was cheap for Bitcoin. I wish I bought it 100000 right? What I think is the challenge here is many people who are, don't understand it go, oh, well, it'll never get to a million dollars or it'll never get to $10 million or $100 million of Bitcoin. Yes, it absolutely can because there's not that many of them. So you can't get distracted by the, the sheer price per Bitcoin. There's only going to be diminishing supply going forward, in my opinion. So at some point, you may have the global population, 8 billion people chasing 5 million Bitcoin. Okay, well, most people won't own a whole one. I, I will. I'll always hold them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I see advertising for GBTC uh, and that discount is shrinking. So I would expect inflows. Yeah, Tom, that's, it's the fees. I, I'm with you. I mean, we talked about it, what, a year and a half ago. We said, if we get the spot Bitcoin ETF, GBTC should go back up to parity and have a big close that discount, right? And it's definitely done that. But because that 1%, I think it was a 1.5% fee, money's pouring out. So new money's not going into GBTC because the average person is not like you, Tom. The average person does not know that GBTC is trading at a discount. They don't. They don't. I'm willing to bet you if I lined up a thousand people and I said, hey, which one of these ETFs are you going to buy? They're going to go, well, which one's the cheapest? And they go, oh, IBIT. I'm buying IBIT. Whereas we've looked at it from, hey, this is one one thousandth of a Bitcoin. It was a trust. You have this discount to it. It, it functioned differently. So the average person doesn't know that. And I think you're right. I think it will go back to parity, but the, inf the outflows will go. And as soon as that gets to parity, GBTC, in my opinion, is going to die unless they change their fee structure. They have to. Um, the average person's gonna look at fees and go, nope, nope, not gonna do it. All right, so that was your first piece, which was the Bitcoin. Uh, this one, I think, is, is an interesting one. If we look at the futures markets, I brought up the point um, that commodity prices have been dropping significantly. And I got this question from John yesterday. It says, when is the time to buy corn with the big exclamation point here? Uh, I... I don't, I don't know, honestly. I am not an agricultural expert, never claimed to be. I do like agriculture products, and I think that there is a certain cyclical pattern to them. We could maybe get somebody on here like Don Dawson, who specializes in commodities, uh, particularly you know corn, wheat, soybeans, that type of thing. Well, if you look at this chart, you can see that really going back into April of 2022, you know this thing has fallen significantly. It should be, I think it's down over 50% or right around 50%. Let's see, we are down 49% right now on corn. Now, the good news for us is most of us consume products that utilize corn, and those products, in theory, should be dropping in price. We talked about that on, I think, Monday or Tuesday show when I looked at the components of Consumer Price Index. So all in all, this is a great thing. Now, where do, where do we think it's going to bottom out? I, I don't know. If I look at this chart historically here, the only thing I can do is, you know, look at historical numbers. And it, it feels like this 340 mark is, is kind of a, a loose line in the sand. Would you guys agree? And, you know, if you go back here to 2008, yes, it tiptoed below it. But it seems that that is kind of a floor for it. You know, we could, we could add another one on that goes to these exact low points here and call that your, your bottom for it, right around 300. 
Okay, um, you know, here we are at 416. Well, you know, my gut tells me this is going to have a big about face. I don't know the supply. I don't know how they're growing the crops right now. I don't know if there's, you know, tornadoes coming through the through the Midwest where the corn's growing. I, I just don't know those things, unfortunately. My gut tells me that at some point you're going to see this thing have an about face, just like natural gas, because, you know, a lot of these commodities, they're not going to go to zero uh, unless we have the anomaly like we did with uh, crude oil back in 2021. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know, John, when is the time to buy corn? If you're trading those futures markets, you, know, you, you have to respect this trend is your friend type of attitude. And it's just been going down and down and down and down, especially, I mean, this last couple months has been absolutely brutal for it. You go back into December of last year and it hasn't had, a, has it had a green week? Every week has been negative. I mean, it has not had a, a positive week in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Actually, it's had one. So one out of ten ain't bad, I guess. Um, and it looks like it's actually picking up some momentum here and moving to the downside. So my bias here is still going to be corn is going down. Um, you do have some demand levels. There's a small little guy that we're at right now. There's another one a little bit lower, but uh, I, I don't know if I would go catch this falling knife. I think the safest thing to do here, and this is what I've been preaching to you guys, kind of explaining my style for so long, is when you have something that's not aggressive of a downturn, catching the dead bottom is a very precarious thing to do. The best, safest thing to do is to wait for it to bottom and wait for it to start to move up and, and make a new high, break that downtrend line. That would be the safest thing to do. So, you know, a couple different ways you could go about that. Um, I don't know if I could add moving averages on here because I don't have another indicator for free. Let's go see if I can do moving averages. And we'll just add on a simple moving average here. Yeah, I didn't think I could. That's not going to let me because I don't have a... Uh, let me take the stochastics off my chart here and I'll add in moving averages just so we can have that for fun. You know, this is a very simple way that people like to do it. It's just follow some moving average. And, and which one are we going to use? Well, that's a matter of personal preference. If you're a shorter term trader, you're probably going to use something like the uh, 20 period moving average. And let's see, this should be a nine as the default. So let's say here's a 20. And you'll say, all right, well, it looks like it's been trending down. I'm just going to wait for it to close above that blue line right there. So if that does happen, then maybe you jump back in this, but it's still on a fairly aggressive downtrend. You know, you could also wait for pivot highs and swing highs to be made using core strategy from Online Trading Academy. But um, all in all right now, it, it looks tempting, but I, I would leave it alone. It just feels like it's, it's going to continue on until it moves back to the upside. I know it sounds so mundane of an explanation, but, you know, better to wait than buy this thing right now and have it just completely free fall on you and blow your account. So there you go, John. When is it time to buy? I would say when it convinces us that it's actually bottomed, turning and starting to make some new highs and at least at least slowing down that rate of descent, which right now feels like free fall for anybody who's long corn. Um, who looks at 1.5% on something that's up 400% a year and is accelerating? I think it's more of the GBTC story. Maybe, maybe. I think new people are getting in or just going, they're going to be asking, well, who's the... Who's the best one? So if you're you know, a financial advisor, you're probably not going to be pushing GBTC. You're probably going to be pushing IBIT because it's BlackRock. It's the biggest one. You know, got, it's, it's, it's the, the bellwether. At least I think it will be the bellwether. So it's also, you know, it's kind of like drug reps at, at, for doctors. Which, which drugs do doctors push? Typically the ones that they are getting uh, pushed by drug vendors. You know, I was watching a special last night on Xanax. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different uh, benzodiazepines that people can use. But, well, which doctor is going to provide Xanax or Valium or uh, Lorazepam, whichever one it is. Well, whichever one they're maybe getting kickbacks from or perks, but really what the drug reps are pushing on them. And I, I think it as a financial advisor, it's going to be kind of the same way. And, you know, since these firms have relationships with the bigger firms, they're not going to look at Grayscale and say, we want to make sure we're doing business with Grayscale. We want to make sure we're doing business with BlackRock because if we ever need anything, we need a bailout, a handout, some help financially, new products and services, BlackRock has a much more vast uh, library of assets for us to access. So they're going to promote and push that one. So that's kind of why early on I was saying out of these 11, I think you're going to see the BlackRock one survive. I think you'll see the Fidelity one survive and uh, possibly the ARC fund because they'll promote their own thing. All right. Uh, what was this comment from Blue Diesel? A uh, question. Do you see some of these institutions manipulating the Bitcoin price, like making it crash to buy it cheaper, or has that boat sailed uh, to play the wheel game? I definitely think it's possible. I think what you could get is you could get some of these firms issuing 
bad headlines or releasing statements, something that could cause Bitcoin to, to drop significantly to buy back in. I think the writing is on the wall now, at least in my opinion, the institutions see this as it's not a passing fad, it's not going away, and there is tremendous upside potential here. So yeah, that's historic as they're going to manipulate things to the downside. The question is, how do you do it, right? If you are BlackRock, do you accumulate a lot of Bitcoin and then do a market sell order to crush it and scare the hell out of everybody into selling? The reality is you've got people like myself and Big Eb and, and several others here are going, I don't care if Bitcoin drops 40, 50% from here. I'm not going to be selling mine. I'm not going to get scared out. November of 2025 is that point. I'll reevaluate everything and most likely sell all my Bitcoin. But until then, nothing will shake me out of it. Nothing. Um, so I think it's a different animal. When you look at something like buying an individual stock, GE or Pfizer or whatever, and that thing crashes 50%, I've got stop losses in place, so I don't take the, I don't take the hit. Um, with Bitcoin, my attitude is completely different. And I think that's that's kind of the same for a lot of people in the in the crypto world is I'm a hodler, right? I've, I've got that Bitcoin, I'm holding it. Now, some of the other markets, yeah, I might I might dump some of my cryptocurrencies early if things really start to, to crush this outside. I'll go ahead and do it. Yeah, yeah, please, please do, Oliver. I'd love to buy somewhere cheaper. Sometimes doctors push the ones that insurance companies will approve. Correct. Yeah, you know, it's... Oh, we could get on the whole topic of the drug, the, the the medical system in America, which I'm definitely pretty frustrated with. Um, exactly. Just buy more Bitcoin. Yeah. Not only buy it, but take it off the exchange. Take it out of Coinbase's hands, right? If you can do that, you're actually helping facilitate bigger moves to the upside because less Bitcoin is on the exchange for anyone to buy. And if that number gets reduced, the number of Bitcoin on exchanges then the price of Bitcoin will accelerate even faster, particularly as these new wave of buyers come in. All right, enough. No more Bitcoin. So I did corn. Jeffrey wants to know, thoughts on Pfizer, please. I don't know if that's how you spell Pfizer. Uh, let's see, P-F-E. I think you got a Z in there. Yeah, it's I-Z-E-R. Let me go to a daily time frame here and show you that one real quick. Um, Jeffrey says, thoughts on Pfizer, please. Well, as you guys know, in my trading plan, there it's written that there's certain things I cannot trade. Um, it's funny because Don Fron, I asked him for three or four times, hey, let's make a wager on the Super Bowl. Let's make a wager on the Super Bowl. And every time his response was, oh, okay, but my, my if, if I win, you have to trade Apple. I'm like, dude, you know it's, it's part of my trading plan that I cannot trade Apple. It's kind of like going to somebody who's been in AA for... 10 years and saying, hey, if I win this bet, you got to take a shot of Jack Daniels. Like, don't be an ass. I, I can't do that. It's it's against my core. You're, you're, you're trying to, prov you're trying to get me to do something that I have, I have built my foundation of my trading world around is that discipline of knowing I'll never trade Apple again. So Don Fron and I did not make a bet much to my prodding of, dude, pick anything else, anything else. We'll do it. He wanted me to trade Apple. I said, no, the other thing I can't trade is Pfizer. Why? Drug stock. Now, let's let's be fair here. If it's my understanding, and last time I looked, Pfizer had over 300 different drugs. It, they're, they're on the market right now, over 300 different products. So to me, Pfizer is not as dangerous of a pharmaceutical company as, as uh, you know, a company that's one or two drug stocks. You know, when you look at this list here, let me really quickly bring it up for you. You look at this biggest percentage gainers and losers. Typically, these are all going to be therapeutics. Drug stocks. So let's see. Uh, that's microcredit holograms, co pop culture. Nope, these are not today. All right. Well, the biggest gainers are not CPS. Wow. I'm wrong today. Normally they're always. Um, oh, Dropbox. I got a question about Dropbox and Roku. Normally they're, they're pharmaceutical drug stocks. So I, I just stay away from those. That said, you want to know my takes on Pfizer? Well, this one's actually pretty easy. Um, I like Pfizer, certainly long term. I don't think you can go wrong with Pfizer just because it is such a juggernaut and has so many products out there. And as a country, we are addicted to drugs, period. Whether you're talking illegal ones or you're talking over the counter, you know, your Xanax, your Zolofs and all these other, you know, antidepressants. So we are totally hooked on drugs. But you know what should happen in America? What should happen in America is it should be illegal for pharmaceutical companies to promote their drugs in printed media and television. Because now what you have is someone like myself going to my doctor saying, oh, I have all these headaches. Could you prescribe me this drug and this drug and this drug because I heard it's the good thing? Of course those drug commercials are gonna show us the best. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that, it should be the doctor's decision about what you take. Anyway, um, if I look at this chart, Jeffrey, I, I don't like it. 
there's only one positive thing about this chart of Pfizer. You can go back into the high prices here we had going all the way back into uh, 2021 when this thing peaked out around 60, 61 bucks. Great. Uh, right now, you are down significantly. You're down well over 50% on Pfizer. So if I can get the dead high here, it's going to be tough. Uh, Pfizer right now getting to this level here to where we closed at today, down 55%. Ugly. Now, to me, my mantra has always been the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. And I'll add that moving average. It's going to be clear as day. We're still trending down. I'll put a bigger time frame moving average like the 50, right? So it's it's not looking good that said there's something that's changed here in the past three months and that is the fact that it right here in february early february we didn't drift down here and make a new low we didn't get down below the low of december which is i'm not saying that this is the turning point like hallelujah we've we've now rounded the corner and, and pfizer load the boat what i am saying is the pain the fear and the selling has slowed down because if it was still there we would made new lows we would have continued this trend and continue to make lower lows lower lows lower lows but we've we've stabilized here so while this, i don't believe that this is the 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 turning point it is something to pay attention to here and notice that we are starting to see the bottoms get higher the highs are still getting lower which means compression at a certain point <laughs> at a certain point what we're going to get is a break above a pivot high. So there's one right there around 28.78. That would be like an early one. For me, it's really you start to get excited if we get above, let's say, 30 and a quarter. You've really got to start breaking these highs. And I know that you're like, well, if I buy at 27 and it gets to 30, you know, that's an extra $3 profit. I'd rather leave that on the table. I'd rather let, let the market have that one and I'll buy in late. If you're really aggressive, Jeffrey, you could be buying Pfizer right now. If you're already holding it, then I think you've got a couple choices. If you are long Pfizer, you, your ultimate stop loss should be down below 25.76 and just say enough is enough. Um, you could be more aggressive and use some of these more recent swing pivot lows. But all in all, um, I like that Pfizer is stabilizing and not making new lows, but it still looks like it's, it's not a good buy right now. And that's just my, my two cents. Again, I am not a financial advisor, but based technically, uh, this does not look that appealing at this moment. I, I would wait and move on to something else. All right, so there's Pfizer. I got corn out of the way. I got Pfizer out of the way. Let's see what else I had. I had a couple more questions that came through. Of course, I'm more than happy to talk about whatever you guys would like to talk about. Um, okay, <laughs> this is from Allison. Would you buy Roku here as a long-term investor? Um, let's look at Roku's chart. This was one of the biggest losers today, I believe. I saw it pop up on a list. Oh, wow. Um, the answer is no. Too much golf today, Big Ed. Well, I didn't get my invitation. I, where, where's, where's the invitation there, Big Ed? Wow. Golf. Now, unfortunately, I suck at golf, but maybe I just don't play enough. Uh, good to see you, my friend. So you wrote on there, Allison, as a long-term investor. That's a, a great dis distinction here because if I look at this chart, I may, if I have time and I'm sitting there on Monday and I'm in a day trading mode, I may look at this as a potential buy as a day trade only. It looks scary as hell. It looks just like Akamai did the other day. You know, you could argue that you've got this small little demand zone here right at the base and that might be using that one. But remember, if it closes down below that yellow box, it most likely is going to fill this gap. And it feels like Roku is going to fill the gap. So as a day trader, I might trade it. The second one is, if you're looking at this as a long-term investor, which you clearly state in your uh, question here that you sent in, I got to say, absolutely not. I don't use Roku. I, you know, I have enough networks. I have my television and my television. I've got all these. I have, I've got Netflix. I've got Paramount. I've got Peacock. I've got Hulu. You know, I have all these different networks. I have, don't use Roku at all. So for me, I, I don't really know any of my friends either that use. Does anybody in here use Roku? If you, if you use Roku, Type in the chat that you use Roku. I'm not saying that Roku is bad. I'm just saying I don't use it. I don't know anybody that, that does use it. If I'm going to be buying something long term like this, I need to look at the landscape of competition. And I don't know whether you throw things like Disney Plus in there and HBO Plus and HBO Max. All, does all that get lumped in here as a competitor to Roku? If it does, Roku better, better do something very different. Um, you know, their, their earnings today, as you can see, weren't bad right? They beat earnings ever so slightly. 
but they're still losing money. They lost 55 cents per share. So while they beat earnings, they've been losing money, right? They lost $2.33 last quarter. They lost 76 cents a quarter before that, $1.38 before that. This is like your broke friend is always like, hey, can I borrow five bucks? Can I borrow five bucks? Can I borrow five bucks? Pretty soon, you're going to come to a situation where you got no more money. And, you know, I, I just brought up the last four or five earnings announcements. Let's, let's go back here and find out if Roku has ever been profitable. All right, I'm, I'm clicking back through the earnings announcements. Not one of these has shown a positive number yet. You know, you can, oh, there we go. Last time they were positive was February of 2022. So for two years, they've lost money every quarter and missed expectations. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think I could... To, I don't think I could feel comfortable saying to buy Roku. And, you know, you look at this chart and you guys know the way I think. I'm making higher lows. I'm making higher highs. That's all fine and dandy and it's near a demand zone. I just I just don't think Roku, I don't know. I, I'm looking at the chat here. I've got, um, I don't really know what, I don't know what Roku really, yeah, neither do I. I got a no Apple TV. Oh, Joe uses it. Yes, I thought Roku was for gaming. No, no, it's just a, it's kind of a, a TV channel. Um, had Roku stick when I first cut the cord. I use it, not very happy with it. No, I mean, you know, one of the things I was told by my mentor many years ago, he says, if you're going to buy something long term, you kick the tires and you drive the product. You know, you go down to the store. If you want to buy Apple, you go to the Apple store and you test their products. You see how business is going. And I, I have used Roku in the in the past because I had a friend years ago who actually bought a TV. And it was a Roku TV. So they kind of tried to, to lock you into Roku by buying the Roku TV. And the TV was super cheap. Um, the earnings by itself scare me. I mean, it's just been eight quarters in a row of negative, And you can only hemorrhage so much money before you finally disappear. And I think the competition is too tough. So Allison, um, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a pass. I, w I wouldn't touch Roku. No, nope, not going to do it. Uh, all right, next one. I was long Dropbox and got destroyed today on earnings. What would you do? This is from Alex. Uh, yeah, I just bring that one up on that list. Let's go D, uh, Dropbox at DBX, I think. Oh, God, this is brutal. Um, I've used Dropbox in the past. I like it now. I think there's a lot more competition in that space and in ways to send big files and share things. So, um, you know, looking at this one, you're asking what would I do? If I was already in it, well, I would probably take a shot of whiskey and, and feel pretty depressed here because going from, you know, $32 and change down to 25 today, that's a pretty significant decline in the value of Dropbox. Now, what does that mean for it? Is this the end? Uh, my guess is they probably did a pretty bad forecast. If you look at the earnings today, they beat earnings. They beat earnings by four cents. They're, they're making money. They made 50 cents um, they expected to make 48. So all in all, it can't be that bad with Roku, but my guess would be, and I haven't looked, that the guidance is very bad for Dropbox. And, and I would be citing competition and, and different alternative methods to this where you can uh, store, transfer, share things for free. Um, so yeah, I what would I do here if I had it? I would probably, whew, if you want to hold this one long-term, and protect yourself, I would probably spend some money on puts. I would buy some puts and I would hold on to those and enough to offset my position. Otherwise, I would probably wait for it to drop below 24. And if it did, I'm out. You know, the, if you're, and I'd read the press release too and see what they said about their, their forecast going forward. My guess is you probably had, oh, you know what? I do recall this. You had downgrades today too by, um, Oh, I saw this when I looked at my upgrades, downgrades this morning. It was uh, Bank of America and Goldman Sachs both downgraded Dropbox. I think Goldman downgraded to a sell, which, you know, that that typically represents a bottom. <laughs> when Goldman says to sell something, usually uh, it bounces back up. Yeah, I don't know. This is a tough one. You know, this is why I encourage everyone to get out of things before earnings. You just never know. And, and that was a pretty brutal day for you, down 23% on your Dropbox. So I, I don't know. I would pers If I wanted to hold this thing forever, I'd probably buy puts on it. Um, the real thing you should do is close your position, take the loss, and just tell yourself, I'll never hold through earnings again because this type of stuff can happen. You know, Dropbox is a pretty big, stable company. It's not like a, you know, a tiny little penny stock that nobody knows. This is, this is a big one and got slaughtered today. See what that volume was. You can see the panic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, your average volume on this bad boy is about $3 million a day. And today... Uh, you traded 21 million, so you're seven times normal volume there. A little bit of panic out there on Dropbox today. All right, what else do I have? Um, I did have somebody ask Kramer. 
Yeah, whatever Kramer says, do the opposite. So if Kramer says that you should hold it, sell it. If he says he should uh, buy it and, and hold on, dump that thing right away. Um, the other one that came through, well, this is a text message from a friend of mine, but I thought I would ask you guys. Um, he asked me about DWAC. This is the Donald Trump-owned social media company. Now, I mentioned when this one first came out that I would not touch this with a 10-foot pole. I feel like this is a flat-out money grab. And having looked at some of the business dealings of Mr. Trump over the years, I would have no faith investing in a business of his at all, no matter what it was, right? You, you couldn't beg me to invest in one of his projects. Now, if you look at D, and that says nothing about my feeling for the guy, okay? I'm not trying to make a political statement here. Just looking at his business deals over the years, it always seems really shady, always seems like people get hurt in the process, and the only one who ends up smelling like roses seems to be Donald Trump. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the court case today. I think he has to pay $300 million for artificially inflating how much money he has so he can get all these loans for his commercial real estate. I think now he's banned for three years from doing any business in New York whatsoever and doing business with any bank that's out of New York, which means that he may not be able to get loans. So this this really could dampen his style. But to me, it just goes to show the, the type of person he is from a business deal perspective. Now, if we look at DWAC, DWAC soaring on the news. Yeah, it's 355 million. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty big one. And everyone's like, oh, it's a witch hunt, it's a witch hunt. It's not a witch hunt. You lied on your applications. You there's documentation that show that you fraudulently overstated how much money you have, the value of your assets, and what you're worth on to the to the lenders. But then when it came to do your taxes, you showed the real numbers so you wouldn't have to pay all that money. I mean, that that's that's in my mind, that's kind of fraud in a in a nutshell. So here's DWAC, right? You guys remember back in, oh, heck, uh, early on in this program, if you go to October of 2021, when this thing first came out, I'm going to zoom in on that part just so we can see. Um, this is when it first went nuts, right? And this is, hey, Donald Trump's doing a social media company that's going to compete with um, with Twitter at the time, it was Twitter. And it soared. Well, you know, they, they Truth Social exists, Um I don't use it, and the reason I don't use it is I think that you're getting a limited subset of the population. You're getting certainly people who are um, diehard Trump supporters or that follow his follow what he is saying, and I think you have a small subset. To, to expect this now, to have a valuation of $10 billion, this is now, based off this current price, has a valuation of $10 billion. Um, I got to say that not only would I not buy this company, I would be more inclined. It, it actually uh, received SEC approval to be converted. So the merger when um, Digital World Acquisition is going to buy Truth Social, that's now approved. So this will be listed as an official stock. It will take Truth Social and make it public. From my understanding, Donald Trump has over 58% of all the shares. This, my friends, is a money grab from some group that said, hey, President Trump, at the time, President Trump, we would like to build this for you. We'll call it True Social because you're so anti-Twitter and you think they're always coming after you. Well, let's build your own platform to bring all the people that support you to it. To me, this is a money grab. And we'll give you 58% of it. He has a controlling of all of it. To me, I don't think that that is, is safe at all. Um, you look at some of the best run companies out there. The guys running it don't have 58% of it. So I would, I would not buy into this one, Alex. I, or not, Alex, this is from someone else. Uh, but I would not buy in a DWAC. I would actually wait for it to officially convert, get the new ticker symbol, and then I may actually be looking at, at it for a short opportunity. Because if you build these two social media platforms, a lot of people hated Elon Musk when he bought Twitter, took it private. I think Twitter has gotten a lot better. I actually do get a lot of my, my news and research from Twitter. There's people that I really um, focus on and, and believe that they're doing good things. There's a guy named Coffeezilla, for example. You know, if you are kind of in the digital world and understanding that whole piece, Coffeezilla is probably one of the most ruthless reporters out there. And he goes straight for the source. He doesn't care if you take bribes from you or give you false information. It's about fact. And, that's, and his, his whole mission is, I want to be as truthful and honest as possible, and people deserve that. Mainstream media cannot be truthful and honest. If I'm the uh, New York Times, and I find that somebody is doing shady business. Let, let's just say, I don't know, um, 
Let's say I, I believe that Donald Trump's businesses are really shady. If I start writing article after article exposing truth, factual documents about this, I'm going to get sued by Donald Trump and his organization. And I now have to pay for legal costs and court costs for all of that. While I'm still maybe publishing the truth, I can't do that because it's going to cost me too much money. So these independent journalists, I think, are really doing a great job. There's less exposure to it, and, and they can get in there maybe uh, in ways that the big ones can't. So... Uh, I'm a big fan of Twitter. I use it. What is, Pepe says, X has improved a lot. Still tons of, oh yeah. Yeah, that, and that's, it's trash. You know, I have people that tag me every single day on Twitter, or X, what do you want to call it? And they're trying to pump some crypto project on, oh, you're going to get all this crypto for free. Guys, you're never going to get crypto for free. No one's going to give you crypto for free, particularly Bitcoin or Ethereum. None of that crap's going to give it to you ever. It's a scam. So yeah, I just block them. I have, I have more people blocked than I do followers. I think I've blocked, I don't know, probably 20,000 people at this point. And good, I'll block even more. You know, Oliver says Tucker Carlson. Um, you know, you look at his interview with Putin. I thought he did a very good job. You know, I thought he did a good job. Now, I, I'm not going to hang my hat on any one of them, but I am going to look at multiple different people for information and see if I can get an unbiased view of these markets and or just the world. I don't know if Truth Social or Truth Media is going to be where I want to go. So I personally think you're going to get a very small group of people that use this. And over the years, I do think it'll drift down. I think that the fact Elon Musk took over Twitter and now turned it into X and is very pro-free speech and has been exposing a lot of the issues that Twitter had in the past, I think that actually is very bad for this, this DWAC. And I don't know... I, I just don't think that this will make it. Um, again, it's going to give, yeah, I saw it earlier, you posted in there that's going to, Thomasina said it'll make him $4 billion. Yeah, uh, apparently this will make Donald Trump $4 billion. But remember, that's all shares that he now has to sell. So you got to put yourself in his shoes. If you've got 58% of a company, you have millions and millions of shares, you're paper rich. What he's got to do is he's got to sell that stuff. So what will happen most likely is once this merger happens, they'll take a good chunk of money and do a massive media push. I mean, massive media push. It's probably going to time perfectly with the elections. They will do a gigantic media push to get everyone to buy into Truth Social. They will probably get bots to inflate the numbers of subscribers to Truth and then drive price up and then be able to unload all that on unsuspecting uh, investors. It's a classic pump and dump thing. Um... All right, let's see. So that was the uh, DWAC one. What else do I have on here? Um, someone asked, can I do my analysis of stocks? I think they're going to go up and down every day. No, I'm not going to do that for you guys every day. Come on. Uh, I was just showing you the process. You guys all have your own methodology, but I won't be doing that every day. Uh, maybe every now and again. Uh, two trades. So I had FedEx. And I want to make sure I, I had to close this one out to you. FDX. So FedEx, I got stopped out on today. The tail just drifted right below. It took me out. 234.79. And then, of course, rallied back up. Got to love the way that happens. Um, but, yeah, I went long on it yesterday. Stopped out. Cost me about 300 bucks. That's okay. The other ones that, you know, expired for me today, which was a fantastic one, is IRBT. I sold a couple weeks ago the $12 puts on this one. And today we closed at 12.35. That was like a 15 14% rate of return for two weeks. That was a really good trade. I'm uh, happy with that one. It had a pretty good amount as well. So that was a good one. Uh, what else? Uh, silver today. I, I was so close. I did not sell calls against my position. I was so close today, but I, I still have not sold calls against my position on silver. I do believe we are going to see this thing start to move up. Now, the good, if we go back to what I just talked about um, with, what was that, with Pfizer, we're right at that point where, you know, on Monday or Tuesday, silver could pop above this 2170 mark and all of a sudden we're now making higher highs, right? We've broken this downtrend that's back in place since December. Great. Uh, if that happens, and I think you're going to be challenging that 2350 mark again in a very short window of time. So I like the fact we're kind of showing some positivity. This week's been fantastic for silver. And once we get a little bit higher, I'll look at selling some calls against my position when people are dying to buy calls. Love it. Pepe says, I hate when that happens. Yeah, but you know, Pepe, that's part of trading. You know, I, I could easily candy coat it and be like, oh, guys, I didn't make that trade. I made the trade. I lost. I'm happy to share that with people. I don't care. As long as it doesn't kill me and take a huge, huge, huge loss, uh, no, it happens. Thomas says, I love my FedEx. Sorry they did that to you. They didn't do anything to me. No one did anything to me, Thomasina. I'm the only one that did anything to me, right? I'm the one who analyzed it. I'm the one who put my entry stop loss on my price targets, and I'm the one who pulled the trigger. So there's nothing you can do here. There's no one to blame but myself. Um, you know, even when I took that trade, I was like, eh, 
not my favorite one, but I'll do it. And didn't work out, but it's fine. I mean, all in all, if you go all in all, you know, this has been a great week. Uh, and I could outline a couple small little losers. Fine, who cares, right? I, I don't care about taking losers. I'll, I'll share the losses. It doesn't matter to me because it's the it's the things like the, the I, IRBT completely erased those small losses this week. And then you look at the silver, of course, this week. And well, I mean, obviously the Bitcoin's been the, the big thing. I know, it, it does get to you, Tomasina. I know, you just got to shrug it off and go, eh, no big deal. Here's another one. So I, I mentioned I was going to talk about this on yesterday's show. Holy cow, we're already this far along? Goodness gracious. Um, you guys may have heard of SCMI, right? This supercomputer thing, SCMI, which, or, or sorry, S SMCI? There it is. Super microcomputer, SMCI. So I had this question yesterday, and unfortunately, it did what it did today. I was looking at this going, man, this is going to be the mother of all shorts. This is going to be the mother of shorts. And, and why? Well, look what happened with SMCI. For the longest time, you go back here to 2023 and go to these lows that established back here. I mean, it really just went sideways from August till February. So really nothing. This is horrible. Yeah, supercomputer. And then it broke out. It broke out on January 19th. Now, just from those lows that just a couple days before January 19th, which was the lowest January 17th on that breakout, it has now moved up 229% in that short, short window of time. Actually, it's for the high we achieved today. So I was looking at this going, you know what? I want to buy some puts. And unfortunately, I did not wake up at 6.30 this morning. I slept in, I was just tired, so I did not uh, <laughs> do anything early this morning, unfortunately. Yeah, it had a huge pullback uh, today. It was down 19.99%. This is Prince's favorite stock, 1999. Um, that's a big percentage drop. And I'm bummed, man, because when you have something that moves this much, you just you know it's going to have a pullback. Uh, I'd love to see the PEs on this one. In the last couple of years, I mean, this thing has gone back in 2018. This thing was trading at 8 bucks. Now it's at 1000 This is definitely going to... Uh, have a pullback on it. What at least say? Heard Wall Street bet. Heard Wall Street bets is now involved with that stock. I know someone who bought puts today. They're expensive, and you, you know what? Um, that's the thing. When I looked at the puts yesterday, they were really expensive, and I was gonna buy not a ton. I mean, obviously, a thousand dollars is gonna be an expensive put, but I was gonna buy some. And I'm like, you know what? I I just I felt it moved down too much today. This is not like that Vinfast, you know car company out of Taiwan that does not being used. These guys are actually building products. And of course, what, what caused all this? What caused it? AI. Oh, we're now involving Rackspace and building um, you know, bl server blades and storage for AI systems and networks. And we'll come to your company help you set up your AI infrastructure. So of course, this thing is absolutely soaring. To see the valuation go up that much that fast, screams of pullback. So if someone asked what I would do with it, I'd be looking for shorting opportunities. I would definitely be looking for, yeah, Margaret, I, I should have done spreads. Just ask Tom. He knows I should be doing spreads, but for some reason I don't. <laughs> Maybe it should be my New Year's resolution. Yeah, there'd be a lot of custom built servers. Exactly, Mark. And and they are, they're legit. You know, they're not like a hoax company like DWAC. In my, in my opinion, DWAC is, is a pipe dream that I think is going to come falling apart. This one is actually doing something and they got a lot of business and... You know, going against that's difficult, but there certainly is going to be moments like today where it pulls back. And I'm very curious to see what happens on Monday. I wish that this one right now, I wish that this red candle happened on like a Monday or a Tuesday. So you could see what the follow through would be for the rest of the week. What's nerve wracking about this for anybody who's long on it is it closed at the dead low. So, you know, you look for supply demand type components. You do have down here right around 680, which would be another 100 and 120 points down, 130 points down, uh, a demand zone where it had its last basing before it rallied out. So all in all, uh, if you are looking at this long term, well, there might be some buying opportunity. I will not be jumping on it. I don't like chasing things that move that far that fast. It just makes me too nervous. And, and their umbrella is, guess who? Yep, exactly. Yep, that's it. And they do, well, they do work for NVIDIA and AMD and Intel. But I mean, it, right now, I mean, all you have to do is just say, oh, we're working with NVIDIA and your, your stock pops up like crazy. What if you sold a call spread? Might have been cheaper. Yes, definitely would have been cheaper. Absolutely. Nothing will happen on Monday. Oh, that's right. Sorry. 
Force of habit there, Liz. <laughs> You're right. Nothing will happen on Monday. When it opens on Tuesday, uh, we'll see how that one performs. All right. I think I got everything I need to cover in here. I got my SM, SMCI. I got my DWEC. I got Corn. I got Pfizer. I talked about Dropbox, Roku. Man, got it all done. All done. So let's go look at our Forex factory piece here to see what's going to be happening for next week. Of course, Monday, nothing will be happening. I will not be doing a show either because I'm going to take a day off. Um, you really don't have much going on for the U.S. markets. The only real big things here would be for the Canadians. You see the CAD. That's going to be at 530 in the morning on Monday or sorry, on Tuesday, um, our Tuesday session just has CB leading index, so really nothing going on there either. Now, of note, if you notice some of these currency pairs here, I've been watching this Japanese yen kind of keep ticking back up, but um, since you're talking Canada, let's do US CAD, and you've got this kind of, it's stair-stepping up, but really kind of sideways consolidation here. Nothing that exciting going on with that, so uh, I, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on this price chart, nor their CPI numbers that are coming out, and that is gonna be on Monday, or sorry, Tuesday. Other than that, um, I don't have much going on. There are actually earnings announcements that are happening on Monday, but markets are closed. So you do have to shift that over to what goes on on Tuesday's calendar. So here we go with that. Uh, yeah, in, in video reports, um, Monday, or sorry, Wednesday night. So here's what's going on Monday. You can see the earnings for the 16th. All right, fine. Um, let's, oh no, not Monday. Here's the, today is the 16th, here's Monday. So you've got a couple of Transocean Energy, but other than that, not a lot of big names in here. It's really going to Tuesday when I click here on the 20th, then we get your big names. Walmart, Home Depot, BHP Group. So for your natural resource guys, you have Palo Alto Networks, Medtronic. So there are some big names happening on Tuesday's reporting. Uh, but yeah, the big stuff will be, the real big one is just gonna be Wednesday. I cannot wait. This is gonna be insane. It's aftermarket close. So you'll see some nice movements on Wednesday's trading, which of course we'll talk about, but really it's all gonna be about Thursday morning. What happens Thursday for our markets is the huge wild card right now. Um, I, would, I would take that one very carefully. Slide dog wants to know about CL. Um, what's the drink? Um, today is a Bib and Tucker 12 year bourbon. It's a really, really good one. Oh, wow. You know, you, you know, you're drinking slow when your ice cube looks like a little mushroom in there. Anyway, Bib and Tucker, uh, next GDP report, I believe is three weeks out. Pepe. I think it, didn't we just have one? It's two or three weeks. Um, you know, one great resource for you guys all, and I, I kind of do it for you, but I would encourage you to do it yourself is if you go here to Forex Factory, if you go to filter, right, you first click on calendar, then click on fact, uh, filter, and you can just say, select none and pick the US. So now all the economic data is gonna be just the US, and then you can start to just click on the upcoming months or upcoming weeks. So you can see all this is for the US. Uh, oh, sorry, preliminary GDP is actually next week. That's gonna be on, when, uh, on the 28th, so not next week, two weeks out. But we do have the core PCE price index in a couple weeks, but gives you a heads up as to what's going on. Oh yeah, Pepe, I use the big cubes. What about Microsoft? Now you guys wanted all the ticker symbols. I was gonna do a short show today. You just keep pulling me in. Ay, 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 ay. Microsoft, Mr. Softy, as my good friend Mike McMahon would say. Well, you know, this goes, this looks almost like the inverse of what we saw with Pfizer right? Pfizer was drifting lower and lower and lower, then all of a sudden started to stall and maybe maybe making some new highs. This has been trending up and up and up, stalling and maybe making some new lows. Now, I really wouldn't shake a stick at this one or care until we get below this low from January 31st, right? That low is 397.21. If we close below that low, which is just $6 away, that's not that far, then all of a sudden, We've, we've not made a new high and we're breaking a swing low. To me, that's where we start to have a little bit of a problem. And at this point, I would not worry about it. But you, you know, if I do not own Microsoft, but if I did, actually, let me rephrase that. I do not own individual Microsoft shares. I'm sure in some of the uh, mutual funds or ETFs I own, I've got Microsoft in there for sure. I would keep it. And if I broke this 397 mark, then I'd be getting out. Because I, I do think you're gonna have a pullback in the markets at some point here. I don't know when, but just put a line in the sand and you say, all right, I'm gonna lock in my profits and move on and jump on it. What else? I saw a crude oil question came through. Let's look at crude oil, the old CL. I love it. I, I, I'm liking crude oil. Now I think it's gonna go, you know, you've got this overhead line I've drawn on the crude oil chart at 79.29. Now that's just measuring the peak from January 29th. You notice we also have these tails that go back to November 30th of last year as well as November 14th. So we are seeing the transition here. 
it's it has not made a new high, but it's certainly making higher lows, and it's done that since December of last year. That's a sign of slowly building strength, right? Now, what happens if it breaks at 79.29? I think you're gonna see very quick jumps. It'll probably jump straight up a full, you know, buck 70 up to right around 81 bucks, and then you will reevaluate those levels from there. But you know, this is more critical than you think because it's not just crude oil's price. We looked at energy being about 8% of the uh, CPI numbers and if energy starts to surge, inflation starts to go back up and then all of a sudden we hear, oh, rates are off, rate, rate cuts are off, we're gonna hold and maybe raise later this year. So again, I said in January, this is the big wild card. If we break 79.29, I'm bullish on oil and bearish on the markets, which times up perfectly with my hypothesis there on Microsoft as well as crude oil. Only time will tell. Um, in 401k, Margaret, didn't have a choice. 401k. Uh, let's see. I was both. You want me to? Uh, I, was, I was surprised to hear that. Yeah, it's only in one. It's only in the 401k. All my IRA stuff is ETFs. Everything self-directed there. But yeah, just, just in that one. That's large cap, large cap uh, growth fund, which is going to be probably the S&P 500. Uh, it was cash for a long time, then moved it back. Okay, so I did it. Economic announcements. I got the calendar in there. Pepe is asking questions nonstop, trying to get me to a one-hour show, but that's not going to work. Uh, it is, what, we got seven minutes left, but I'm going to wrap it up now. So I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Is there anything fun going on this weekend? Yeah. Well, it should be sunny out here in Southern California. I hope you guys all have a great weekend doing something enjoyable on our uh, time while we're spinning around the world right now. We are actually rotating at an alarming rate of speed. Most people don't know that, but uh, we are spinning very rapidly. So hopefully you guys do something fun while we circle the, circle the sun one more time. So I will bid you guys adieu. Cheers. Have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys for joining me today. If you have any comments, questions, feedback, email right, right there. TraderMerlin at gmail.com or put him down below any of the YouTube videos. That said, have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.